This, 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 this show is brought to you by Safety FM. Listeners, this is Brent Sutton. Welcome to the 69th episode of the Practice of Learning Teams podcast show. On today's show, I'm joined by Eliza Lynch, who is a safety practitioner in the construction sector and keen advocate for the new view of safety, and in particular, how to help workers be more successful. Please sit back and enjoy this episode of Risk Appetite and Reflux with Eliza Lynch. So yeah, I stayed away from the, from the new view stuff for a long time. Um, and it's probably only in the last probably two years since I moved back to Ireland that I've really started to, I suppose, dig into it a bit more. Right. And we, we you know, I, I mean, I, I really love the construction industry because it's a true expression of what I'd term dynamic risk. Mm. Because, you know, every day people are facing the same hazards, but the situations that arise when those hazards can be present is constantly changing. And yeah. when, I, when I look at people who do really well in the construction space, it's because they've really honed those sort of problem solving skills or those critical thinking skills. Yet those things don't sit well with traditional rules-based environments, do they? No, they don't. Um... And I suppose like the construction industry, while <laughs> like, yes, it's obviously male dominated, but it is quite diverse in um, the types of people, types of men, I suppose, who, who mostly work there and um, everything from like ethnic background, literacy background, education, skills, all that kind of stuff. It's so diverse and this kind of one, Size fits all one approach to how to manage that just is is kind of bizarre really when you think about it well how could you possibly think that this one way of doing something is the only way and that everyone must i suppose march to the beat of that drum i guess yeah yet, yet people every day are so successful at their work yeah D- d- despite you know the data that we read about you know the harm rates and and, and the fatality rates of the construction sector, the, the fact is people are super successful. If, if we think about how many hours they spend, the conditions they're working in, the types of changes they're dealing with, um, the, you know the environment that they're in, um, you know I, I take my hats off to, to them that they are really really successful. Yeah, I'd agree. They are, like they are. I mean, you just have to look around. It's everywhere you look. It's everywhere you look. Construction is touched. It's you know, and uh, yeah, it's always um, it's always interesting to to get out on sites and see the challenges that that people are facing and that they're just getting on with it. And you know, like you'd walk out, especially when when I started out first, it would be walk out on site and and the safety manager would encourage you to actually take a physical copy of of the um. I remember what you call them in Oz, the SWIMS, the Safe Work Method Statement. Take a copy of that now and go out and watch them do the work and you can see, you know, you can see how they, and if they're doing it right, and you'd be standing there reading this thing going, sorry, what? Like this yeah, doesn't what's reflect, the this no. doesn't reflect anything that's actually happening, like at all. At so all. If, but in, in spite of it, they're 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 getting on with it and getting things done. Yeah, so so was is the system supporting them to be successful? Or are they successful in spite of the system? I would say in in spite of it, probably. Um, now, look, I mean, it's not the same across the board. It obviously depends on the, the size of the company, the resources the company has. Like when I suppose when I started out first, I was in working for an ASX listed like tier one blue chip, whatever you want to call it, a big a big outfit. So. For the most part, they were well resourced. The equipment was good. You know, yes, programs were tight or whatever, but in, in general, they were well resourced. There was no shortage of labor or anything like that. Versus smaller contractors who would who would 
have a lot more challenges in that regard in with you know type of equipment labor all that kind of stuff and so yeah i would say it's probably even more true for the smaller contractors that they are succeeding in spite of of the challenges they're not exactly set up for success it's it's get it done yeah in spite of everything yeah, and the, you know, the construction industry is notorious for its, um, you mentioned it before, its whole contract chain relationships. Mm. You know, principals, contractors, subcontractors, sub subcontractors, and it just keeps going down the yeah. layers. Yeah. And, you know, the, the system that the principal have and the systems that are five or six layers deep don't even resemble each other. Yeah, no, they don't. They don't. Yet, um... Yeah, people are still successful. Yeah, because this, like, because the systems are not real things. I guess they're not. Yeah. You know, they just are this 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 idea or this you know file in a cloud or this binder of paper, whatever it is. It's not real. So that's why they're they're just getting on with things like those. Systems don't mean anything to the to the people on the ground. Yeah. From what I understand, from my conversations with people on the ground, they don't care whether it's called a SWIMS, an SPA, a JSA, a JSEA, whatever. It's not informing their work, really. Right. And, and when they're having to um, engage with those systems, uh, if they can't see themselves in it, if it's not reflective of what they need to do, Mm. then does that mean it's simply just a tick and flick? Just a, you know, just a acknowledge and move on or complete the paper because we have to? Because we Is have it... to, yeah. It's it's a tick and flick. It's a ritual. It's um, a comfort blanket, depending on, on who you are, who's looking at it, I guess. Um, and I think the the higher up the chain you go, it holds different meaning for different people. Right. That's how I would probably look at it. So the guys on the ground are probably like, whatever, I'm signing this because I'm being told to sign it and this is to cover somebody else's arse. It's not really to help me do my job. Like it's not, a, they're not, again, <laughs> I'm conscious of God who's listening to this. This is very much my experience of it, but like a tradie on the ground isn't going to be like, ah, yes, I love my safety paperwork. It keeps me safe every day. That's just... <laughs> ridiculous like it's just no and then it's, yeah, and then you move up you move up the layer and it's like oh the safety advisor is like oh this is like a layer of work i have to do and then you move up another layer and it's we're getting into like this, the supervisors the management and and ceos whoever and it's and then it's that's when it becomes the comfort blanket because they believe that it is providing some sort of protection for them or for the workers or whatever but there's definitely a lack of understanding of what its purpose actually is some of them actually yeah. do believe they're like, oh yeah, this is safety. You're like, oh god, it's not. But okay. Look, I, 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 I probably believe that for the most part, the organisational's intent is coming from a good place. Yeah, I would agree. But how it's then being applied, how it's being used, is not being seen as valuable to those that are facing the risk. Yeah. And, and I, I think that's, yeah, I, that's I, our I, challenge. Yeah. Now, that, that, that's our, our, our challenge. Uh, and, you know, we, we recently released that white paper about learning from everyday work. Mm. And we sort of made the comment that, that most of our systems that exist um, are asking people to assess or evaluate things that it's based on workers giving permission to the system, not the system looking um, for the workers' permission, if that makes sense. It's sort of, I, I sometimes puzzled as to, as to why we've got it around the wrong way. Because only workers can decide whether they feel they are safe enough to commence work. Yeah. Yet we uh... fixate. Now we, we tell people, um, you know, stop work if you feel unsafe. Yeah, and I suppose it's then it's a thing of, 
Jesus, we could go right down a rabbit hole now, but it's like, it's what is safe yeah. and is it safe enough? And what is risk and taking risk? And you have, if you don't take a risk, you don't get any reward. And so, you know, this simplification of, oh, just stop work if it doesn't feel safe. But like, I could walk onto a site and see something and go, Jesus Christ, the state of that, this is a disaster. And they will, they'll have a completely different risk appetite to me. They'll look and go, no, Lisa, this is actually banned and this is how we usually do it. And, you know, all this kind of jazz. And, and there's a complete, there's, I suppose, a gap there to be bridged between what I feel is safe, what they feel is safe, what actually is safe. And it's all, yeah. and it's, it's, it's dynamic, it's moving, it's changing all the time. That's another issue with this whole, oh, well, we've assessed the risk. It's like you've assessed it, but did you mitigate it? And you assessed it when? Back in the office versus out here where it's happened? Well, and look, I would probably guarantee that their appetite for that same risk would also change over time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because, I would, yeah, I'd agree. Because there are so many factors, and, and I think this is part of our issue, um, that we, we keep trying to um, identify all the potential factors that influence people. And, and, and I know very early on when I, when I first met up with Todd, now, one of our very early conversations that if we actually went back to the basic principles of trying to control and mitigate how the hazard releases energy, we wouldn't have to worry about all the other side around people and their behaviours and, and how they function. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like even, I suppose construction specifically there are so many hazards and risks that you go why was this shit not designed out way way long? you know so far back in the process and we're dealing with stuff on at a site level that you go like <laughs> not tearing all architects engineers all of these people with the same brush but they don't have what they're, they're like end user in mind not the end like person building not the people on the ground, how to build constructability and even not even constructability, but like safety within constructability. So they don't, they don't look at that. They don't consider that. Um, I don't know, my yeah. off on another tangent now. But, uh. but I, I agree. I, I'm, I'm working on one at the moment where um, uh, in a construction space where um, the sling gave way during a, a, a lifting process and you know you, you you would think that someone's committed some form of you know capital crime that that stormed the senate and 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 i i asked a really innocent question i basically said um did your lifting plan i identify that the load could shift in it and i said uh, yes we did and i asked the question well what control was in place and they said we established an exclusion zone during the lifting process and and I asked the question uh, w was anyone present in that um, exclusion zone during the lifting plan and they said no so I said so we we planned for the unexpected the unexpected happened and the controls function as intended so should we be, should we rather than looking as this is a form of um, uh, persecution, should we mm. not be celebrating that our controls function as expected? I actually had such a similar thing happen years ago. Like I wasn't long, I wasn't long in the job. And like that we had, a, it was a dropped object. So it wasn't lifting whatever, it was a dropped object and it fell into an exclusion zone. And I was... Delighted with myself. I was like, sure, isn't this great, lads? The exclusion zone worked. And everyone looked at me like I had three three heads. Like, what are right. you talking about? This is a disaster. I was like, all right, all right. And that's, I quickly learned then to, to not celebrate the success of control measures of exclusion zones because, well, it shouldn't have dropped in the first place. Well, but it did, though. So, but but, but isn't, but this is why I keep going back to this is what I don't understand. We, we, we put these things in place for the remaining amount of uncertainty. Mm. So, so the control itself, I mean, I love it. I mean, once again, you know, I get told, you know, 
every person's, every tool above a certain height needs to be tethered to stop it falling. Mm-hmm. And I asked the question, so um, how is that tethering achieved? And, and it's basically a behavioral control. It's up to the individuals to do it. Yeah. And I said, how, how easy are the tethers are able to access? All, all the usual type things that we ask. Um, and, I, and I said to him, well, but the problem is you're still leaving a whole a lot of uncertainty present. So these nets you're putting up, is that not their job? Is their job simply to respond when the hazard um, occurs? Is that not its job? So why, why are we scared of celebrating? <laughs> why, why are we scared of celebrating? This is the bit I don't understand. Because, because safety is not meant to be any crap, Brent. We're not allowed to have fun. We're not allowed to celebrate. <laughs> we're not, it's only bad stuff. That's all. That's all we're allowed to have. Which is, which is interesting because when I think about risk management, risk management is based on threats and opportunities. Mm. But in safety, we treat everything as a threat. We don't look at it as an opportunity. No, no, we don't, no. No, we're just, we're, it's just everything is fairly negative. To, it can wear you down after a while, to be honest. Um, yeah, it is. It's, it no, look, be, I'm, 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 I'm 100%. I mean, you know, and and, and the sad thing is, uh, I, I would challenge people by saying that this negative context has basically meant that we're only prepared to learn after it goes wrong not mm-hmm. before. Yeah. Like learning from success is not, um, it's, it's it's never the goal to, you have to really, I find like you really have to push people to be like, sure, this, this went well, let's look at that. Nope. It's like, it went well, move on. Bl- keep blasting on, just keep going, build, build, build. Instead of going, can we stop and take a breather and look at, what went well, why it went well, learn from success, and it's not, uh, it just doesn't come naturally to people. Sure. Yet, yet learning from failure will never allow us to see those frequencies or similarities. Or but also, I don't parent. think, sorry to cut across you, but oh, even I would even say learning from failure, we probably aren't great at that either. If we went down the whole, you can blame or you can learn route, you know, we're probably fairly crap at that. In general. Well, look, I, I, I agree. <laughs> I, I mean, in construction, um, the term learning is um, fix the bastard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You just dropped the first swear word, so you've opened the floodgates for me now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it actually, it actually, that word has meaning. That, that word has actual meaning in the English in the English dictionary. Um, so, but. But, but isn't that the case, that, that it's not learning? Fixing is not learning. Yeah, correct. Yeah. I'd agree. And, and I was with a group yesterday where, we, where, where the, the conversation was about trying to, you know, build leaders. And, and, and I'm always a bit sort of resonant in this sort of space. And, and you know, they were saying, suggesting, you know, what books to read. And, and I said, well, well, you know, you can, you can either, you know, look at great leaders or you can look at great dictators and you'll probably find common threads across both. Um, but but ultimately, uh, why don't we talk about this thing that is an, an innate skill that we all have, which is about being curious. Mm. And that curiosity, the thing that we had as a child, that, that thing that allowed us to learn, why did that get knocked out of us as an adult? Yeah, um, well, definitely within safety, I would say it's the because you're meant to know, <laughs> you're not, you're meant to have the answers, you're meant to be the all knowing, the whole, oh, this is the rule, this is how it's done, this is no, you can't do this, why? Because safety said so. It's that's there is no like, there is no curiosity in, in how safety professionals are trained, how they're educated, like, it doesn't exist, even in, even in incident investigation techniques or whatever your eye cams or whatever it is it's it's not through a lens of curiosity like that's yeah. that word that word until i started 
virtually hanging out with people from this kind of a new view uh, stance, the word curiosity never came up. Never came up in like six years. Wow. So, wow. Yeah. Just like it's, and even now I'm doing, um, I'm doing a, I'm, I've gone back to college, I'm doing a higher diploma in safety, health, and welfare. And, um, no, there is one, there is one module where, where it came up, but that's, um, the lecturer is Marion Coyley and she's into safety differently, Kinevin framework, art of work, all that jazz. But right. she's an anomaly against all the rest of the lecturers who are just very traditional. Like it's such, it's actually <laughs> quite, been quite disappointing so far um, because it's a really expensive qualification I'm doing and there's literally no talk about learning or curiosity or anything like that. It's very much blanket rules, all this usual tripe. You know. Yeah, so back to that whole the technical elements of safety, which 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 really fascinates me. I mean, I, I'm fortunate. I, I teach. I'm one of the lecturers of the diploma down here in New Zealand, um, mm. the New Zealand Diploma in Safety, and you know we we really talk a lot about the whole communication collaboration components around leadership, and we also explore you know the, the true context of risk management, not not about safety, but about that whole thing about risk management, mm. and how you know. What, whatever the first phase of risk management is all about the whole thing about scope, context and criteria and whatever we miss up there has a huge knock on effect mm. and and you know and all risk management says is that you need to get wide and deep representation around the nature of the risk to get the best picture and any bits that you do miss, you then have to have a good treatment plan. You have to have the whole continuous improvement because the fact is um, our assumptions have to change over time. Now, if, now, if we think about that language, that's very much the language that Safety 2 uses or Safety Differently uses. It's this whole thing about how does the system learn? Mm. Which, in fact, in risk management, the system is always trying to learn. If we, if we think about, um, you know, d despite the, the huge effect that COVID has had around the world, I think the, the presence of COVID has really brought good risk management back into the spotlight. Yeah, or the, or the lack of it, I <laughs> think, well, in some instances, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and, and that's because... Um, COVID has demonstrated to me about this whole nature of dynamic risk. Mm. That, that viruses by their nature must evolve because they have to evolve to survive. Yeah. And if our system doesn't evolve with it, it's never going to be able to basically, you know, um, offer those level of protection. And, and it's really interesting that with COVID, what I'm seeing now is that more of a risk management is being focused on the present, not the past, because you, you can't predict the future. Thank you, listeners, for being part of this podcast. We would love to hear your learnings or other topics you would like us to explore about learning teams. Go to www.podcastlearnings.com and give us your feedback. Become part of the community of practice with learning teams. Go to www.learningteamscommunity.com. Support the authors of the practice of learning teams. Purchase the book from Amazon.com or go to www.learningteamsbook.com for an inside look and other free book resources from the authors. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the host and its guest and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the company. Examples of analysis discussed within this podcast are only examples. They should not be utilized in the real world as the only solution available as they are based only on very limited and dated open source information. Assumptions made within this analysis are not reflective of the position of the company. 
No part of this podcast may be reproduced, stored in a retrieval system, or transmitted in any form or by any means, mechanical, electronic, recording, or otherwise, without prior written permission of the creator of the podcast, Jay Allen.